And so we'll give a story from Rick Doblin, who figured out a way to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, one of the ways that I made a difference was being inspired by my own psychedelic experiences. And so I, I think, thank you for the opportunity to tell some uh, drug story. <laughs> and um, today there was a, a fair amount of discussion about um, the mystical experience and how the mystical experience is uh, connected to therapeutic outcome with psilocybin but how that's not the case with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And yet, for me, the most mystical experience I've ever had was with MDMA. So I've been thinking about that a lot and thought that that might be a, a story to share how that came about. And it, it began at Esalen, where I was learning about MDMA, back actually in 1982, and it was a month-long workshop on the mystical quest taught by Stan and Christina Groff. And it involved holotropic breath work, and, um, and a lot of guest lectures, and uh, one of them was Brother David Steindlross, who's a, a Roman Catholic monk, who is, uh, is amazing he hasn't been excommunicated, <laughs> you know, but he's not a, uh, he's like a, a mystic, uh, ecumenical, very open-minded, and when I learned about MDMA, it was legal in 1982, and we were starting to think we needed to approach other people uh, from not stereotypical kind of drug-using groups, but just um, people like monks and rabbis and uh, meditators. And, and so with, and I started talking about MDMA with Brother David, and, and it made it, it, it felt to me like it's very peaceful, it's very self-accepting, and that in half dose, it could be really good for meditation. So Brother David tried it in the monastery and uh, <laughs> ta talked about some of the, one of the other monks started trying it as well. Um, and I, I got called to the Father Superior, like, like and, and what, what is these monks? And, and you know, <laughs> and, and it was really helpful that it was legal still. And, and I said, it, it's part of this understanding of mysticism and global spirituality. And there's this, um, you know, d deeper kind of um, respect that's being paid to the experience. And it's not something you do all the time, but you can deepen your meditation practice, perhaps. And it's, it's people have used fasting and all these ways. And, um, and, and he, this uh, Father Spear said, okay, they can keep doing it. <laughs> which was uh, um, kind of uh, uh, amazing. And, and so I just was thinking about that a lot. And, and there was this um, part of this um, suing the DEA where it was um, a little bit um, unclear for me how to do it in a skillful way and, and not get really you know, smashed. Um, and yet at the same time, um, I felt it could be done and, and I had through these workshops at Esalen and um, the meetings, I'd gotten pretty comfortable at, at being there and I'd found my spot. I found a place to camp out. Um, you're not supposed to camp out there, but there's a place right down by the ocean where it was kind of private. And when the tide went out, um, I could gather up some small stones and stuff in buckets and, and create this little bed the mountain came straight down to the ocean. There was big rocks out there that, that blocked the, um, wa the waves. You know, there's a, a freshwater stream going right by. There's mountains right behind you. Um, and the high tide would come, like on the stage, the high tide would come like right where you guys, your feet are, right there. But you could have this, and then the mountain is right here. But there was this little spot that was like perfectly safe. <laughs> um, throughout the night, throughout the high tides, the low tides, it's just, you know, exquisite little, little spot there. And I got pretty comfortable uh, camping out there and, um, you know, walking around there at night. And I thought, okay, this is a really good spot to take MDMA one night. <laughs> and, you know, I felt like I could do it by myself, that there was people there if I needed to talk to anybody. It was, it was 
you know, I felt really protected in that way. I didn't have to worry the phone was gonna ring, the police were gonna come by, uh, <laughs> nothing. And so I did it at, at night, it was just an incredible night, and, and I spent a fair amount of time um, looking at a tree and um, imagining it was different like DEA people, um, <laughs> sort of looking at me. And I was trying to figure out, well, how do I build this relationship? <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, you know, I, I find, you know, could see ominous figures or friendly figures, and I, I just somehow came to the idea that um, sort of that they're looking for what's under the rock. They're looking for what's hidden. Their, their whole thing is conspiracies and secrets and all this kind of stuff. And you just come at them straight directly. Um, it's probably a safer way to do it. You know, even if you're still occasionally having these experiences yourself and talking about it and being willing to acknowledge that. But it's something that I felt like, okay, I could um, do it in, in that way. And, and that there's a part of the DEA people that really want to know what drugs are like. I mean, they're, 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 they do because the stuff that they've been told about how bad it is, it's like nobody would want to take the stuff, but people do. So they're kind of curious about it. And it, it's good to, I think, help them see. Sometimes, so I, I found myself even sometimes explaining what, what it was like to be high or stuff with, with some DEA people. <laughs> and, and so I, I sort of worked through that kind of um, process and then the tree became back to a tree. <laughs> and, and then I just was like um, amazed. It's like it was now in the middle of the night and the stars were just so super bright and the, the waves were crashing and, and I just felt like the universe was so big and I was just this little speck and, and then I felt scared I could just disappear like there, it was like like and I just almost like thrown up in the universe or just be connected just somehow lose it just was a little bit scary part for a moment and then I felt like well I haven't disappeared <laughs> somehow I am still here I mean just like and it was just this kind of recognition there was something that was keeping me there and that this something was gravity. And this gravity was kind of this loving force that was keeping me um, together. And, and I was wondering, like, how does Brother David live a celibate life? You know, why, why does a monk, why do you want to do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and then I kind of saw that the, the, the good part of it is that then I felt like this gravity, that I was cradled in the arms of gravity, and it was like a lover. I, I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. Um, it, it felt like so warm, like it was actually a real person, and, but it was this gravitational force, gravity. And I felt this cradled in the arms of gravity, and it made me feel connected in a way that um, it, uh, I never was quite so lonely ever, more, ever again after that. And it, it, it felt like a, um, a sense of, yeah, this was the most um, woven into everything, me disappearing and, and still being there and feeling this, this loving connection. And that was 1985. Um, it, it, it did have those positive effects. And then a few months ago, um, I had a chance to sit next to Brother David after, all, after 30 years um, and um, at a conference in, in um, Madison. And so I was able to talk to him a little bit at dinner and I, I kind of was able to um, share with him that this most mystical experience of my life had been about contemplating him and his, his life and that, that um, I wondered you know what? What he, and he, he's he's just an amazing man. And and, and so he, um, I said it, it was about gravity that, that for me it, it came to be the, the the loving force of gravity. And and he looked at me and said, you know, um, I think about gravity every single day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>